Welcome to Delighting in the Trinity with Michael Reeves, brought to you by Union. This podcast brings you teaching and preaching from our archives, and you can find more resources, audio, video, and books at unionpublishing.org. Good morning, everyone. You've come again. Well, <laughs> we have Richard Sibbs, the outrageously dressed Richard Sibbs, to start you off. Just to say, Richard Sibbs, and we're going to be looking at how Richard Sibbs, Sibbs can really help us grow in our love for Christ. Now, just to say, with Sibbs, um, he looks like this because of the age he lived in, and people often dressed like that. I know, I know. He was a rough contemporary of Shakespeare, if that helps you understand why he's dressed like that. Um, Sibs became known by many in his generation. He was deeply influential as the heavenly Dr. Sibs. And he was called that not because of any remote otherworldliness, but because of his sheer loving kindness his good-natured amiability. Um, and still today, you get a sense of that, and I hope you'll pick that up. Um, this portrait, he's not smiling in. No one smiled in their portraits. Well, and the reason is, it's not that everyone was grumpy before photographs came in. It's that you have to sit for this thing for a, a long time, for days, so you can't sit there going... <laughs> which you probably would have done. In fact, there's... A very rare 17th century portrait of Sibs smiling at the portrait. No one ever smiles at portraits, but it just, he's got a twinkle in his eye. It gives an indication of what sort of man he was. And you still get a sense of that. I hope we get a sense of that in his writings. His, his sermons, um, they still glow with a sunny warmth. He's deeply, deeply attractive. He's a man who clearly enjoyed knowing God. And his relish is infectious. He spoke of the living God as a life-giving, warming sun who delights to spread his beams and his influence to make things fruitful. Such a goodness is in God, he said, as is in a fountain or in the breast that loves to ease itself of milk, just bursting with goodness. And knowing God to be such an overflowing fountain of goodness made Sibs a most attractive model of God-likeness. For he said, those that are led by the Spirit of God are like him. They have a fountain-like goodness in them that loves to spread itself. In, a, in other words, knowing God's love Sibs became a deeply loving man. And his understanding of who God is transformed him into a man, a preacher, and a writer of simply magnetic geniality. Now, um, Sibs was never married himself, but it's very clear that he had a quite extraordinary gift for cultivating warm, long-lasting friendships. Charles Spurgeon once said that, well, he once told his students that he loved the sort of minister whose face invites you to be his friend. The sort of minister on whose face you read the sign, welcome, and not beware of the dog. <laughs> I think Spurgeon could have been talking about Sibs. Sibs' face read, welcome. He was primarily a preacher. More than anything else, he was a preacher. And a phrase he often repeated in his sermons is, there is more grace in Christ than there is sin in us. Isn't that a great thing to hang on to? In all your sins, no, there is more grace in Christ than there is sin in you. And knowing that, he always sought in his preaching to win the hearts of his listeners to Christ. Know Christ better. And this, he believed, was the special duty of ministers. He said, ministers woo for Christ. 
They open the riches, beauty, honor, all that is lovely in him. One main end of our calling, he said, the ministry, is to lay open and unfold the unsearchable riches of Christ, to dig up the mine, thereby to draw the affections of those that belong to God to Christ. And the result was preaching so winsome that struggling believers began to call him the honey-mouthed Dr. Sibbs the sweet dropper. And, apparently, hardened sinners used to deliberately avoid listening to his sermons. They'd go to other churches for fear of being converted. (laughs) Let me give you um, the record of um, what one man, Humphrey Mills, who experienced Sib's ministry, said. And this seems to be a fairly typical experience of Um, listening to Sib's preaching. He said, I'll read it if if you don't want to go through it all. um, Mill said of Sib's, he said, Mill said, I was for three years together wounded for sins and under a sense of my corruptions, which were many, and I followed sermons, pursuing the means. I was constant in duties and doing. I was looking for heaven that way. I was so precise for outward formalities, I censored all to be reprobates, false Christians, that wore their hair long or not short above their ears or that wore great ruffs. (laughs) Oh, gorgets or fashions or follies. And yet I was distracted in my mind. I was wounded in conscience. I wept often and bitterly, and I prayed earnestly, and I had no comfort until that sweet saint, Dr. Sibbs, by whose means and ministry I was brought to peace and joy in my spirit, his sweet, soul-melting gospel sermons won my heart and refreshed me much. For by him I saw and had much of God and was confident in Christ and could overlook the world. Now my heart held firm and resolved and my desires all heavenward. That was pretty typical of Sibs. In fact, I just want to urge you to read is the shortest work of Sibs that's easily available. A tender heart. You can order it from banneroftruth.org. But um, there's some sibs on the table there you can get, the bruised reed. The bruised reed is an unmissable reed. It's wonderful stuff. But the tender heart, I, I mention this because it tells you something about what Sibs' ministry was about. That in all his ministry, Sibs always sought to get underneath the superficial layer of his listeners' behaviour and deal instead with their hearts, their affections, their desires, those deeper things that drive behavior. So he didn't simply want to control people's actions. He wanted to affect their hearts, their desires. And he saw that this was a profound Reformation insight. He believed that a problem in medieval Roman Catholicism had been that the Roman Catholic priests had been trying to simply control the external behaviour of people, which is just a superficial thing. Whereas gospel ministers seek to affect and change hearts, to win the affections of people, so that they desire Christ, seeing he's so good. And again and again in his sermons, Sibs would speak of um, both Catholic priests, Protestant pastors, who, whatever their professed theology, forgot that. And began, these pastors, he saw, were acting as if the root of our problem lies in our behaviour, our external behaviour before God. So our problem is we've done wrong things. The solution is start doing right things. And Sibs says, no, 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 no. We need to plumb much, much deeper. Our problem is our hearts have gone astray. I haven't desired the Lord. I've I've thought other things are better than him. 
And if as a pastor I simply seek to control someone's behaviour and I succeed in controlling their behaviour so their behaviour looks good, all I'm doing is cultivating hypocrisy. A self-righteous cloak for a cold and vicious heart. No, he's seeing that's not the way to do it. If you do minister like that, Sib says, invariably your ministry will be cruel whether you're a pastor or just encouraging other brothers, because you're trying to beat people up with behavior, not wooing their hearts to live for Christ. No, he said, hearts must be turned and evil desires eclipsed by stronger ones for Christ. And so he sought to preach the gospel to make his hearers know themselves to be children of the loving Father, that they might naturally begin to love him. So knowing his love, that they begin to love him. So what I want to see now, let me just read you a little bit, show you a bit of Sibs, show you how he does that. How does he proclaim the love of Christ so that hearts are won to him? And I'm going to read you a little bit from that um, sermon, The Tender Heart. And um, I hope this might warm your affections to Christ as you read this. He says, It is not enough to have the heart broken. A pot may be broken in pieces and yet be good for nothing, and so may a heart be through terrors, sense of judgment, and yet it can still be not like wax, pliable, soft. The heart must be melting. And tenderness of heart is got by an apprehension and understanding and appreciation of tenderness and love in Christ. A soft heart is made soft by the blood of Christ. Many say that an adamant... Now, adamant um, is, it's, um, it was believed to be this special metal that could not be destroyed could not be melted except by blood. It was a mythical metal. Okay. Many say an adamant cannot be melted b- with fire, but by blood. I cannot tell whether this be true or no. No, because it's mythical. But I'm sure nothing will melt the hard heart of man but the blood of Christ, the passion of our blessed Saviour. When a man considers of the love that God has showed in sending his Son and in doing such great things as he's done, in giving Christ to satisfy his justice, setting us free from hell, from Satan, from death, the consideration of all this, with the persuasion that we benefit in all this, melts the heart and makes it become tender. So you see, he's saying sin is all about a coldness or hardness of heart. Cold to the Lord. Dutiful, perhaps, but not delighting in him. But the work of the gospel is to warm, to thaw our hard hearts. So they're no longer hearts of stone, but warm, beating hearts of flesh. Let's um, show you a bit more. He says, as when things are cold. You don't understand this in Dubai, do you? You don't know what cold means. <laughs> as, in England, this really makes sense. Everyone's going, oh yeah, we're always cold. As when things are cold, we bring them to the fire to heat and melt. So bring we our cold hearts to the fire of the love of Christ. Consider we our sins against Christ. Think of your sin, how you've offended him. And then of Christ's love to you, a sinner. Dwell upon this meditation. Think what great love Christ has showed unto us and how little we've deserved. And this will make our hearts melt and be as pliable as wax before the sun. If you will have this tender Melting heart, be always under the sunshine of the gospel. Isn't that a wonderful image? 
constantly, every day, have your heart under the sunshine of the gospel. As you hear of Christ's love, you, you're drawn to him. You think, oh yes, I feel warm to him again as I hear of his great love. And what Sibs is reflecting here is the Reformation's shift from medieval Roman Catholicism. He's saying sin now is not this external problem in the behavior. Sin is a problem in my heart. It's that I, I have a coldness of heart towards the Lord and I'm warm to other things. And so since the problem of sin is in my heart and not just my behavior, the solution to sin can't be in simply trying to modify my behavior. No. The solution to sin, said Sibs, the solution to sin is not the attempt to live without sin. The solution to sin is the gospel of God's free grace. Do you understand that? Because if you say, right, I'm just going to stop sinning, you're depending on yourself. Which is doing nothing for your heart. But if hearing of the love of Christ, you go, oh, oh, actually I now want to walk away from those dirty things. I'm actually one now to Christ. See the difference? The grace of God woos us away from our sin. That's the solution to sin. And so he, he's saying you can have an external religiosity but you don't actually love the Lord. But those who are tender-hearted, those who are soft to the Lord, they are people who, and this was an issue that came up last night, those who are soft to the Lord, they don't just desire salvation, they desire the Lord of salvation himself more than anything. They hear of the love of Christ and they say, it's not that I want heaven, some package called grace. I want him, the one who's so kind. I want him. And only then, when a person is brought to a heartfelt delight in the one who's so kind, only then do they begin to hate their sin truly, instead of just dreading the thought of God's punishment of it. See, if I just want salvation, I could say, well, I don't want to sin because I want heaven and sin stopping me. But with a Christian, no, no, it's different. I've been brought to love the Lord because he's been so good to me. I see how lovely he is, how loving he is. And in the light of that, my sin becomes increasingly repulsive in my eyes. And the more I look on Christ, the more obnoxious my dirty sin is. Now, a couple of observations. Isn't Sibs beautifully capturing the warmth and joy of a hearty holiness? This is an enjoyable holiness. Enjoying the love of Christ, being warmed to him. But he also, he's making a very significant point. He's saying, we are sanctified just as we were first saved. We go on in the Christian life just as we started the Christian life. That is, by trusting in Jesus. It's not that you trusted in Jesus, right, stop, now you're left to a a life of self-dependent effort. Because that would be like a system of salvation, wouldn't it? Yeah, if you're trying to earn heaven. But no, Christianity is about knowing him. It's constantly coming back to him, trusting him. Saying, yes, I am a sinner and I, I need you. And as I hear of your grace again, I'm drawn to you. And only by constantly revealing Christ to me does the Spirit make my heart tender. That's, what, that's how I first came to know Christ. That the Spirit opened my eyes, turned my heart, that I began to want to trust Jesus for the very first time. And that's how the Christian life goes on. The Spirit continues to open my eyes. I go, oh yes, that's how good Jesus is. Oh, I want him. That's how the Christian life goes on. 
That's how it starts. That's how it goes on. That's how we grow as Christians. Let me take you to the verse that Richard Sibbs believed was the secret of sanctification, of growing as a Christian. It was 2 Corinthians 3.18. 2 Corinthians 3.18. It's the verse where Paul says, 2 Corinthians 3.18... Paul says, We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Now, what Paul's getting at there is he's thinking of the time. Do you remember back in the Exodus? Back in the Exodus, and Moses goes to the tent of meeting to meet with the Lord. Yeah? He goes in to be with the Lord, and his face shines from being with the Lord. The the Lord of glory so affects Moses that Moses himself begins to shine with the Lord's glory. And then, Moses goes out, and what does he do? He puts a veil over his face as he walks out amongst the Israelites. And the reason is, Paul says, because The Israelites, going around doing these external performances of the law, they're showing they're actually blind. They can't see. They've got a veil over their minds. They don't understand the whole point of the law, which is not external performance. Those things are supposed to teach you the heart of the law, which is turn to the Lord. Love the Lord your God. And so what does Moses do? He acts it out for them. He says, he walks around amongst the Israelites with a veil over his face, going, this is what you're like. Doing all these religious actions, you don't get it. So what would he do? He would turn to the Lord and go in to be with the Lord in the tent of meeting. And as he turned to the Lord, the veil was removed. To go, that's when you'll get it. Turn to the Lord and then you get it. And that's becoming a believer. That's going on as a believer. Says Sibs. He says, the very beholding of Christ is a transforming sight. When I speak to you of Christ, it actually transforms you. If we look upon him with the eye of faith, it will make us like Christ. For the gospel is a mirror that when we see ourselves interested in Christ, we are changed from glory to glory. See, a man cannot look upon the love of God and of Christ in the gospel, but it will change him. To be like God and Christ, we become like what we worship. For how can we see Christ and God in Christ, but we shall see how God hates sin, this pure Glory radiating God hates darkness. And this will transform us as we see it to hate it as God doth, who hated it so much that it could not be expiated but with the blood of Christ, God man. Do you see? It's by beholding Christ as Moses looked on the Lord and so was transformed to shine with the Lord's glory. So as we behold Christ, we become like the one we worship. Whatever you fix your desires on, you will become like. Whatever you fix your attentions on, you dream of, you will become like that. Be wary of what you think much of. And so Sibs once said to the man who is going to be one of the greatest preachers of the next generation, Thomas Goodwin, he said to him, young man, if ever you would do good, if ever you would do good, you must preach the gospel and the free grace of God in Christ Jesus. Young man, 
If ever you would do good, you must preach the gospel and the free grace of God in Christ Jesus. Now, Sibs meant that with every fibre of his being. For he saw that it is the free grace of God in Christ Jesus is the means by which the hearts of sinners are first won to God. And it is the means by which the hearts of believers go on being won and turned to God. And so that's what we need to do each day for ourselves as we encourage each other. We hold up Christ to ourselves, to each other. Hold him up. Consider him. See how gracious he is. Let's be a people who preach the gospel and the free grace of God in Christ Jesus to ourselves, to each other each day. And that will transform us radically from the heart. Our desires will begin to change. Well, so it says, what if we do that? Let's say we actually do that. We actually hold out Christ so that hearts are one. What's that going to look like? He says, what will, it, what will come of it if Christ is set in the highest place in our hearts? He says, well, if we crown him there and make Christ King of kings and Lord of lords in a hearty, from the heart, submitting of all the affections to the soul to him, Now, get what he's saying. He's saying, if you find you actually desire Christ more than anything else, what's that going to look like? Well, while the soul continues in that state, it cannot be drawn to sin. Isn't that a strong statement? But it completely makes sense. If I love Christ more than cocaine and pornography... I will not be drawn to cocaine and pornography, right? For as long as I love Christ more than those things, those have no power over me. While the soul continues in that state, it cannot be drawn to sin, discomfort or despair. The honours, pleasures, profits that are got by base engagements to the humours of men. What are these to Christ, friends? What are sins compared to the beauties of Christ? When the soul rightly gets Christ and his excellency, it sneers, it disdains that anything should compete with Christ. That's being a Christian. We hear of Christ, we preach Christ to each other so that we desire Christ more than other things and so we find we do not want sin. And you know, if you do love Christ, you know what will happen? You will speak freely of him. Because, Matthew 12, it is out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. Do you know where awkward evangelism comes from? Awkward evangelism is done by those who don't delight in Jesus. So they're feeling they ought to speak of him, but it's not a natural overflow because they don't so delight in him. But, says Sibs, Where love is, it enlarges the heart. And when the heart is enlarged, that enlarges the tongue. Strange image, but you get what he's saying. When you love something, you speak of it. The church has never enough, cannot get enough of commending Christ, of setting out his praise. The tongue is loosed because the heart is loosed. Love will change a man's disposition. And you see this throughout the world. In all experience, he says, a man that is base of nature, love will make him liberal. Now, what a shame liberals become a bad word in evangelical circles. Liberal means generous. That's what it literally means. Liberal should be a good thing. Love will make him generous. No, it won't make him theologically liberal. Love will make him generous. He that is tongue-tied, love will make him eloquent. 
See, if you put any worldly man to a worldly theme that he cares about, he'll speak of it the whole time. He has wit and words at will. You know, if a guy just loves cars, he will speak about cars. And he'll speak about them, and he'll speak about them. What you care about, you will speak about. And so as you begin to care about Christ, you will speak of him. And if you really love him, you just will speak of him warmly, compellingly, because you love him. You see the happy difference it makes to holding up Christ and having our hearts drawn to him. But then, okay, so Richard, how do you get to love Christ like that? How does that work? Because this sounds good. How does it happen? Well, it's not something you can whip up. Don't even try. Now, you'll only begin to desire Christ, to love what he loves, and to walk away freely from sin when you see how much he loves you, how lovely and how loving he is. This is 1 John 4.19. We love because he first loved us. And only when Christ is more attractive than other things will we love him like this. And so Sibs tries to cultivate that in us. He says, listen, Christ values his church highly. His church is his very love even at that time when we're sleepy in our sins. And that teaches us in time of temptation not to listen to Satan. Satan, his work is to make us look upon that which is unworthy, which is nothing, which is dirty in us. That's what Satan does. Satan turns our eyes in on ourselves to look at our own failures to focus on that. And as soon as I focus on my own failure, I think, oh, well, I'm such a wretch. God could not love me, surely. Satan knows if we be sensible, if we sense, if we grasp the love of Christ to us, oh, we'll love him again. If we see, oh, no, you're not worthy. Yet, Christ in his unfathomable love stretches out to you in your sin with his grace. That will win you to go, oh, what a Christ. Yes, yes, I begin to love him again. If a man be in love with Christ, what will be harsh to him in this world? The devil knows this full well. Therefore, one of the devil's main engines and temptations is to weaken our Hearts in the sense of God's love and of Christ's. Do you see it? What does the devil love to do? The devil loves to take your eyes off Christ so that you don't sense his goodness, his love. He loves to make you focus on your own failure. And you'll then think there's, t- there's more sin in you than there is grace in him. The work of the Spirit is the opposite. To fix your eyes on Christ and begin to wonder at his love and find your heart loosed. Do you see, it's not enough then to know and to speak the truth. What he's saying here is it must be sensed, if we be sensible of the love of Christ. See, I think in our colder moments, it's easy to say, we know this stuff, we must preach the gospel. Not good enough. Not good enough to say, yes, I understand Christ died for me. No, no, no. There's a vital difference between simply knowing that fact and appreciating that. Living in the warmth of that. And so, here's the sort of thing that Sibs will say to hold out Christ to win our hearts. What he's going to do here, he's just going to try to placard Christ before us to fill our eyes with the vision of Christ's goodness and beauty. He says, do we entertain Christ to our loss? Now just pause there for a second. 
Do you not think that every day? Being a Christian, isn't it you're serving him, you're doing stuff for him, you're giving stuff up for him, and so you're actually a loser by being a Christian. Feel that? You know what I'm talking about? That actually, aren't I doing so much? Actually, I'm sacrificing for him. I entertain Christ to my own loss. No, he says. Does Christ come empty to us? No, he comes with all grace. His goodness is a communicative. He loves to communicate, to share a diffusive goodness. He comes to spread his treasures, to enrich the heart with all grace and strength, to bear all afflictions, to encounter all dangers, to bring peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Ghost. He comes, Christ comes to you to make your heart as it were a heaven. Consider this, he says. He comes not for his own ends, to get from you. He comes to empty his goodness into our hearts, to give to you. He's not come to grasp, to take, but to give, to bless. As a breast that desires to empty itself when it's full, so this fountain has the fullness of a fountain which strives to empty its goodness into our souls. He comes out of love for us. Isn't that important to know? You'll find Christ attractive when you see he comes out of love for us. To bless us, not to, not to grasp and make our lives poorer, but to bless us, to free us. Now, where's all this coming from? Why is Sib so sunny? Why is his gospel so attractive? Well, I think it comes back to what he thinks the gospel is. You see, he didn't think the gospel is merely about God the ruler having mercy on us, which is how we can present the gospel and leave it at that. He's saying, no, no, no. There's something much, much warmer about the gospel. The gospel he believed, is essentially a love story as Christ the bridegroom comes to win his bride, the church. And now this was a very central insight of the Reformation. The understanding that the relationship between Christ and his people is a marriage relationship. Key insight. Because in medieval Roman Catholicism, here's how it had been. Okay. It had been Christ had basically sort of retreated into heaven in his transcendent majesty. And so Christ had become so awesome and distant, no one felt they could have any kind of relationship with him. He's pure, terrifying transcendence. And do you know what people did about it? They would say, oh, well, okay, well, I can't approach Christ, I might as well go to his mum. And maybe she'll put in a good word for me. And so people would pray to Mary, and Mary will pass on a good word to Jesus, hopefully. Of course, Mary in this role as the Queen of Heaven herself starts retreating into heaven and becoming too transcendent. So people say, well, let's have a word with her mum, St. Anne. And so people pray to St. Anne, hoping that Anne will pass on a good word to her daughter, Mary, who will pass on a good word to her son, Jesus. Do you see? And so you've got this string of mediators... But, if it is true that Christ is the bridegroom and the church is bride, do you want a mediator between a husband and his wife? (laughs) Not unless something's seriously wrong. No, no. And what would the church want from her bridegroom? Would she want abstract blessings, just the chocolates? Hopefully not. Not. Does she, does she want just some thing called grace? A can of Red Bull every day, that'll, that'll do me. No, no, she wants him. This marriage relationship affects the relationship with Christ. If that's what the relationship the church has with Christ, it transforms it, warms it. And think, what kind of standing does a bride have before her husband, before a perfectly loving husband? What assurance. His status, his perfect, unconditional love. And so Sib says, if this be true, 
He says, often think with yourself, what am I? Oh, I am a poor, sinful creature. But I have a righteousness in Christ that answers all. Oh, I'm weak in myself, but Christ is strong, and I'm strong in Him. I'm foolish in myself, but I'm wise in Him. And what I lack in myself, I have in Him. He is mine, and His righteousness is mine, which is the righteousness of God-man. And being clothed with this, I stand safe against conscience, hell, wrath, and whatsoever. Though I have daily experience of my sins, yet there is more righteousness in Christ who is mine and who is the chief of 10,000 than there is sin in me. There is more righteousness in Christ, our bridegroom, with whom we have that closeness of union than there is sin in us. I don't think we can exaggerate the importance of Sib's message for today. See, our busyness and activism as Christians can so easily degenerate into a hypocrisy in which, and I see this particularly in those who have any role of Christian leadership, hypocrisy being such a danger using Christ as a package to pass on to others rather than enjoying him as a saviour for ourselves. And in a hypocritical world, we can keep up all the appearance of holiness without the heart of it, without a hearty delight in Christ. And in that hypocritical world, how will we treat each other Because we all want to look good, we will bludgeon each other and beat each other by control of behaviour into such hollow, superficially looking good Christianity. But true reformation must begin in the heart with love for Christ. And that love for Christ can only come when the free grace of God in Christ Jesus is preached. So let me pray for us now that we be a people who do that. My Father, any true believer here will sense the danger of hypocrisy in their own hearts. And if someone doesn't sense it, they're probably so hard of heart, they simply can't feel it. We all have this danger. And I pray that you would make us, as your people, a people who are not hollow and hypocritical, merely keeping up the externals, but of people who speak to each other of the gospel and the free grace of God, that our hearts might be one, that we might say, yes, truly, sincerely, I'm not making it up. I love Jesus Christ. He's won my heart by his goodness. And the more I see him, the more I want him more than sin. And so I pray, as we hold out the gospel to each other, might we be a people who are refreshed, increasingly delighted in you, more joy-filled at your goodness. And I pray that like Sibs, we might become transformed into the image of Christ increasingly sunny, shining with his warm, loving glory. And so being most attractive for the world to look at as we speak of the free grace of God. We praise you, our great Lord, for being so good 
so pure, so glorious, so kind to us. We bless you and give you all the glory. Amen. You've been listening to Delighting in the Trinity with Michael Reeves, brought to you by Union. Union is devoted to growing leaders and growing churches. Our School of Theology equips leaders for ministry. Union Publishing supplies them and their churches with quality theological resources and books. Union Mission supports and financially helps church planting and revitalization. And Newton House Oxford invests in the next generation of theologians and scholars. Our vision is to see leaders and their churches the world over reformed and renewed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. To find out about our courses and learning communities around the world, to buy union books, to discover support for your church plant, or to become a friend of union and support our ministry, visit www.theola.gy.